Welcome to Hawkett Podcast. Our special guest today is Stephanie, the host of Steph's Rock Show, which you can find on YouTube, Instagram, and Spotify. How's it going? Great. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. I'm doing really well. Yeah. So what you've been up to lately? I know you started your own show, but what you've been, besides doing your show, what you've been doing instead? Yeah. So I work in real estate. I bartend. Um, I'm a mom. I joke. I don't sleep. And uh, I've missed radio for a long time. I almost got back in it in 2018, but I am a single mom, so I don't have anyone to watch the kids during the time they wanted me. So really since 2018, I have been a little bummed that I've wanted to get back into radio and I haven't had the opportunity and wanting to start a podcast, but afraid because you know how it is. You run a podcast. You're like, do I need all these guests lined up? Do I need all of these bells and whistles and an intro? And, you know, I've always been one of three. I I was the same way when I started. And I'm still the same way. I, yeah. I don't have an intro. Never did. I'm not interested. I'd rather just have people watch the show right away. It's like that five to 10 seconds is too much time wasting for them. They're like, okay, hey, let's start the show already. 100%. And I agree. And so I think I overthought it. And finally, I woke up one day, literally just woke up one day a couple months ago and was like, I'm going to buy a computer and a mic and I'm going to start it. And if people don't like it, cool, keep moving on. I'm doing this for me. I think it's great for my mental health to talk to people and to interview people and talk about my day. So I'm absolutely loving it, though. I dig it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm going it will be four years since I started and I've enjoyed it ever, ever since. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah no, be, I think it's be, so healthy. It'll be four years in October. I didn't oh, start awesome. doing interviews until like I think 2022 ish. But I'm doing I did like short span episodes about random topics. And I was like, yeah, this isn't gonna cut it for me. So I was like, I'm gonna start interviewing random people on the internet and I just went from there. And then yeah. it became, and then it then it became artists from different bands. And you'll learn a lot, you know, from just interviewing different people or I was so in music. And now with this podcast, I love reality TV. So I'm jumping into reality TV. I love news. I love that. I want to do everything I'm interested in. I want to find somebody and interview them and learn more. Um, you're in LA, right? Yeah, I am. I'm in okay. LA. That's cool. I was in LA for seven years and now I'm back home in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. So now where are you from? Tell us your origin story, Stephanie. Okay, so I'm from Lodi, which is 45 minutes south of Sacramento. Only child, um, just really no family. That's kind of, I'd say the older I get, it's weird that I'm such a lone wolf. Um, and I had a very strict upbringing, I, which would surprise people or not, because, you know, the people go crazy that I couldn't really leave the house and do anything. Um, I was hyper-focused on school and competitive dance. I loved getting good grades. That was just like my outlet. And at 18, when I got into college and I finally got freedom, I went balls to the wall. Just, you know, uh, my wings were clipped and I got out. But uh, and I found radio in college for an easy A. I entered an ed major. I thought about being a teacher or a principal. I found out I don't like math and the math requirement was really difficult. So someone on the basketball team said, dude, be a communication major and you can party and do sports and keep your grades up. So the whole reason I switched to a comm major was just to party and be on the dance team and travel and not worry about all the makeup homework when I came back. Mm -hmm. And I found radio and was like, this is me. I love talking to people and I love playing music. And, and I really, I knew I wanted to be in radio in college. So did you do like sporting events at your college or do you just do radio? I did. So I was on UOP, University of the Pacific and Stockton, California's dance team for four years. And we traveled with the basketball team. Um, I've always danced. I continued after competitive dancing and college dance team. I started burlesque in Los Angeles and Sacramento. And so dance has always been in my blood. Like, I love it. Mm -hmm. So what kind of form of dance were you doing? Or did you have any training in dance like when you were growing up? Yes, I did tap, jazz, ballet, and then I got into hip hop in high school. And I was actually the only white person to compete in the Apollo in Stockton, California and a hip hop group. And so that was like a really fun moment in my life. I got to be Britney Spears with the group and we got down. So I told my kids I used to be cool. I used to know how to do like the floor work and jump in the middle, you know, of the 
of the dance offs. Now I'll like hurt my back getting up from a chair and be like, that's enough. I'm good. <laughs> so you mentioned your, uh, your upbringing was very strict, like how so you were not allowed to go out and like hang out with your friends or like go out to movies. You had like a, like a time constraint and when you need to come back home. Not even a time constraint. Like I just remember looking out my window and watching everybody play outside and hang out outside. So um, not really allowed to sleep over anybody else's house. Um, I had one best friend, G, that I love to death still to this day. And they would allow me over to her house for a couple hours. And they would allow her in my house for a little bit. And I played video games a lot. I was really into music. I feel like I'd go in the entertainment room because I had so much free time on my hands. And I would get out my six dish changer. And I'd put in six new, that's what's weird. They gave me freedom with the music. I will say I could go to the record store and they didn't even know what I was buying. And I'd pick like the wildest metal and rock and come home and sit alone and put my six new CDs in and just listen to music and play video games all day. But yeah, no, there was, I was not going out. And I, would, I was also so busy. I'd go straight from school to dance Monday through Friday for three or four hours, barely get to do homework and pass out. I didn't have that childhood where you're playing or you're silly or you had just free time, you know? So I think college, I went to like, I just want to have fun. I don't want to be so strict. I had to get straight A's, you know, or it was the end of the world. And in college, I was like, C's get degrees, baby. I'm getting some 70%. I'm showing up late. I, I had fun with it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was your favorite childhood memory with your family? That is a great question. I would definitely say Disneyland. Um, it's fascinating to me, people making fun of adults that like Disneyland. I get both. I, I get where everybody's coming from. Right. So and what I don't think they've understood or the people that I'm watching is. So my family fought a lot. My parents did not like each other. They stayed together for me till I was 18. Right. Like they did not want to be together. So but the only time they didn't fight. So the best memories were Disneyland. And we went two to three times a year. We went a lot and they would get along and we'd have a magical week. And it was just so fun and almost unrealistic. So Disneyland has the best childhood memories for me. And that's why I kind of like to go back when I can. It's so overpriced nowadays. But it's fascinating when people are like, it's weird when adults go. But I think some people don't realize like as kids, that was the only good memory you had and you kind of relive it when you enter the park. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was your favorite part when you were a child? What was your favorite part in Disneyland to go to? I would say that's a great question. Just walking down Main Street, you know, when the gates open, I, I was a runner. Like when they opened the gates, I ran in walking down Main Street. I'd smell the vanilla cones. I knew like I was in this magical fairy tale world that real issues didn't exist. You can kind of leave those at the door. And then also entering on Pirates of the Caribbean because you could smell Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And like that smell of that was usually too. And I'd go to Adventureland first. And that was one of the first rides I would hit. So that's just like a good, these are good questions. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about that. Mm -hmm. So did you have any like favorite Disney princesses that you grew up with that you like slowly when you were a child that like you dressed up as? Well, so Ariel's my favorite Disney princess, but I think because I didn't have red hair till much later in life, I always like to dress up as Sleeping Beauty. And funny story, me and the UOP dance team got in trouble one time at Disneyland because we didn't know it was a rule that basically when you're not a little girl, you can't dress up as a Disney princess because kids could get confused. So the whole dance team picked a Disney princess and mine was Sleeping Beauty. And we dressed up really cute in like the actual outfits. And we got escorted off to the side. They gave us more outfits and we had to actually change in the bathroom from our Disney princess outfits to regular shirts. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Yeah, I get it though, right? Because we're 18, 19. We could have said a bad word. We could have been bad college kids and we're dressed as princesses. So I understand where the park was coming from that little kids could have gotten confused mm -hmm. and thought, oh, Cinderella is talking about drinking beer, mom. That's what I want to do. Like, not good. Not good. So besides Pirates of the Caribbean, what other ride did you enjoy? That you Space Mountain. I, to this day, Space Mountain is my favorite. It's dark. You don't know when you're turning, where you're going. It goes fast. I was really afraid of it when I was younger. So I was all proud that I, in fourth grade, overcame my fear. And I rode that over and over. Mine has to be the Indiana Jones ride. And that's yeah. that one and Pirates of the Caribbean. Those two, that's it. 
I love Indiana Jones. That's a good, and I even loved, it broke down one time and I was all stoked. Like, right, you know where the ball's going to drop on you and uh-huh, you're like getting yeah. ready to go. It broke down. So I was stuck for an hour. The lights went on and I got to walk through the ride to get off of it. And I was like, this is awesome. So uh, have you ever gone to Universal? I have, but it's been a long time. It's been about 10, 11 years since I went to Universal Studios. Um, but I want to go back. I'm actually planning a trip next summer because the kids like Mario. They really wanted to go to the Mario Land. I Have you, you gone to Universal? The last time I went to Universal was probably, it's been two years already. It's been, yeah. a, it's been a while. Everything's so it's, expensive. It's been a while. It's been that long that they've already opened the Super uh, Mario World, World Land. Yeah, and I want to go done, check that out. And they've done construction on the new roller coaster they're building there. That's how long it's been since I've gone to Universal. Wow. Yeah, I want to go. And then, you know, I've been going back to Disneyland with the kids because they can go on rides. But I noticed Universal has mainly, you know, rides for taller people. So I kind of am waiting. And now that they're getting older, I'm like, okay, it'd be worth it to go to Universal. Mm-hmm. So what did you want to be when you were growing up? This, when Before you got into radio and all, what you've done in your past, what did you want to actually do as a child? A professional dancer, a backup dancer for like Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson when I was younger. I loved dance and I thought that'd be so cool. And I didn't really tell I got older that all of them pretty much have to retire at 27, 28 because their bodies give out. It's not like a longevity plan. So I definitely shifted gears in high school, but I love dance. I still, I like to choreograph for other people because performing is, is definitely, I'm done on the performing aspect, but I will still choreograph and, and make up routines for people. How hard is it to be a choreographer and like, like do all like the, bring people together and just do all that stuff? So it is hard because you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of the team or if it's a solo project of that person. And also what's harder for me personally is some people are better at counting it out, the eight count, the five, six, seven, eight. And some people are with the music just as they go, like hit it, pop it, do this. I've always been less of a counter and I'm more of a, in my head, I know what's going on and when to do the move. But when I'm teaching, I have to count it out because most people learn better with the eight count. So it's hard for me to, slow it down with the eight count because I just think music's in my blood. So I'll just be like, oh, I got it. I'm going to hit this move on this time. And for me to teach and count is harder. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, what is, what is Stephanie doing? She's like already in the room and they're just looking at you like confused. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely get in the zone. Mm-hmm. So now as a California native, what's what was it been like for you the last four years since like the whole pandemic started? How did you have to deal with that? So that has been really difficult because, first of all, too, so my grandmother lived in Montana. So I've spent a lot of time in Hamilton, Montana. And then I lived in Austin, Texas for a year. So really leaving my state quite a lot, understanding how different California is in the United States compared to other states. You know, I think when we grow up, we live in our bubble and we're like, everybody's like this. And I love California, obviously. I've always moved back. I love the weather. It's so beautiful. We can go to the ocean and the mountains in one day. But I am not down with the restrictions. I don't like anyone telling me what to do on any level, yes, right? So the, the government coming in and telling me how I can live my life and, you know, and I'm not talking about a safety where I think it's a genuine concern of like, oh, okay, this could be scary, but I had a hard time with COVID for sure. Um, I still bartended. Our our winery stayed open. And um, so financially and everything was fine. But I'm such a social person. I didn't like to not be social. I missed people. Um, I didn't understand from the aspect of, well, we all are going to come in contact with one another. We're not isolated up in the mountains living in igloos. So at one point, we're all going to probably share some germs Let's get this thing over with and, you know, go get vaxxed if you want to get vaxxed. Go wear the mask and gloves if you want to. I'm not judging anyone, but I definitely did not like how restricted we all were during COVID and how I think we're in a better place now, but it really did divide a lot of people and especially in California. Yeah, I definitely will agree. I That's that's around the time where I started my podcast because for that, I was getting into photography and I kind of started at the wrong time is after I got, after I started learning the basics of photography, got my camera and COVID hit, it's like, I need to start doing something else because I, 
I'm probably going to lose interest. So I decided to start doing the podcast and I went on from there. That's a smart idea. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, I don't know why I didn't start the podcast during COVID. It would have been great because I was home. But um, I was having to teach school, you know, because even though like my sons were going to school, they were really young online. So I was trying to help them teach, stay focused, stay on the computer. So it was kind of a full time job all of a sudden becoming a teacher that I didn't think I was going to be doing during COVID. So how hard was it to like keep your kids focused during the like when they were like doing the, all the Zoom classes online? Really hard because I had a three-year-old in preschool and a six-year-old in first grade. So, I mean, they're really young. And so they're trying to do PE on a screen. You know, they're trying to teach them on a screen and they want their boys. They want to run and play and jump and kind of not focus. So to keep them on there, you know, was hard. And I definitely calmed down about how serious I am with school because I just wanted them to be happy. And I, I don't want my kids sitting for four to five hours on a screen anyways. And so even if it's for school, um, I did let them like run around and stuff, but it was. I think it was harder on parents for sure to keep your kids entertained, to try to get them focused on school. And part of the reason I transferred them to private school was because for some reason in California, right, the other uh, states were all different. Private schools were open in person. They were able to do sports and everything. But our public schools that Gavin Newsom shut down that his kids were not Gavin's kids were at the private schools running around. So I finally said, I'm going to bite the bullet and spend some money and put them in private school so they can actually go to school, which I think is healthy for kids. So did they, did they actually learn anything during like the time before you decided to move them to private school? Did they, were they actually learning something? Oh, that's a great point. Um, I think barely no, because you're sitting on a screen and you're that young and they're trying to just tell you three plus three equals six. I don't know if they're learning anything. And also I think school is not just about education. It's about socialization. So interacting with your peers, getting grouped up in projects with people you wouldn't normally get along with. They were missing out on those pivotal social skills that for a year, thank God I had two. So at least they had each other. But other than that, like it's really important to even get bullied. Like literally even get picked on. And how do you come back from that? How do you stand up for yourself or moving forward? It's just so important that kids to be able to go in the workforce one day, go out with each other in school and face to face conflicts and issues they can solve on their own. So now what was one topic or event that made you question the world you live in? Oh, wow. That's a great one too. I definitely would say... I'm going to personalize it, but overall, you know, the 2020, 2021 political polarizing issues, I got fired from my side job in burlesque and I have not performed since because of becoming vocal with my political views. I'd always been a little bit more reserved, especially living in Los Angeles. I knew if I wanted to work, I could not say that um, my grandfather was a well-known Republican judge and I come from a slightly right-leaning family and that is where I am as well. And I was open on Facebook when I used to have a Facebook about where I stood and I then got fired from my job on the burlesque team. And it was so eye-opening to me and a bummer, but life lesson of, wow, like I love these people. I performed with these people for a couple of years. I think they're phenomenal. And we got along great. And I haven't changed. I just vocalized my opinion and I got let go. And I realized I want to be more open and honest about who I am. And I hope that I'm surrounding myself with people that are accepting and okay with it. And I just, I want more people to be accepting of different people, right? Like that's, that is exactly what the problem is nowadays. People cannot like, uh, like if you're left leaning, the right cannot agree with you. And if you're right leaning, the left cannot agree with you. And it's just causing a divide between those two parts. I hate party it. System. I absolutely hate it because I could care less what somebody's political, religious, um, sexual orientation is. You go do you. Like I will work with you. I will hang out with you. Our kids can play. Might not want to be BFFs in my house every night with somebody that we're going to disagree 24-7. But I have no problem going in the workforce with people that think very differently from me. And it bums me out when people let that hinder their life experience. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have like that liberal mindset like all these others like people do that they fired you for that. 
and everybody probably else had like that left leaning like I- ideas and thoughts, but you didn't, and so they let you go. Yeah, um, I was against the riots. So we had really bad riots in California and especially in Sacramento. And one of my friend's businesses actually got completely destroyed. So I was frustrated and went on Facebook to explain my frustrations with, um, I didn't know some insurance companies don't um, cover riots. So my friend's club got destroyed and their insurance company wasn't going to cover it. So I'm complaining on Facebook about that and that these riots need to stop. And somehow it got construed that I am pretty much racist and against a race, which was not the problem at all. I'm against anybody going and throwing rocks through a window and jumping into a building and stealing things and causing massive conflicts and chaos in a city. And I'm just shocked that people don't understand, you know, like there's things I'm passionate about and I'm not going to get a sign and go jump up and down and throw things at people to say that I might make a podcast. I may talk about it there, you know, and vocalize how I feel, but the way it got so polarized and it got the R word. I think the R word is so dangerous and it's so nasty and gross and people throw around that R word like left and right where you could lose your job. You could get canceled. And, and what do I mean? I'm saying I don't like rioting and they're like, Oh, then, then you're racist. And I'm like, no, no, I've dated a black woman. I dated a black woman for a year. I love everybody. Like I said, there's not, I'm not like a, Oh, this is, this is my type. No. And it's so mind boggling to me that you can throw out a hurtful, damaging word when somebody is just saying, can we not have violence in our city? And it's a California issue. I mean, it's a New York issue. It's a liberal state issue. Because if you go in the South, when you're like, hey, I don't think I want to riot today. Everyone's like, okay, cool. They don't think you're like racist if you don't want to riot with a certain group. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the funny thing about that whole issue was some of the black people were destroying other black people's properties and businesses, and they were not even thinking about it. Like you're you're destroying your own people's like things. Hardworking businesses that you worked for. Yeah. I think everyone was cooped up too much too. And we got a little bit unstable from lessener action. Financially, a lot of people were hurting. So I wonder if that played a part in, oh my gosh, there's now a race war and there's issues and You know, I love police because I feel safer with police. And is there bad cops? Yes. Is I'm a bartender. Is there bad bartenders? Yes. You know how many times I've gone and had a bad drink? Every single section of work has people not doing their job the best. And that's just the reality of life. And I I think it got turned into a much bigger deal and issue and complicated problem than it needed to be. Mm -hmm. We've always had race issues throughout our lifetime. This is not a new thing. 100%. 100%. If you look throughout history, every, every both sides have been into some like political stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird because like I just did this religion little podcast because I, I had an eye opening to this Buddha meditation. And I realized when I went to seven different temples and seven different, you know, places of worship with different outlooks, it's all very similar. Mm-hmm. It kind of mm-hmm. it blew my mind that like everyone had the same basic point, love your neighbor. Can you do some charity work? Um, Hey, try to be more positive, try to do the right thing. That was like the basic message in every temple. So when someone's like, well, I'm Islam and I can't, you're Christian and we don't get along. I'm like, you guys are kind of all on the same page. I just like, if you read the Quran and you read the Bible, they're literally the same Yes, religion. That's what I want people like race and religion and all of this. It's we're all so alike. And sometimes we're fighting over things that don't make sense because if you get down to it, I'm like, well, what's your point or what do you want to do? Or when people are debating and it's like, you know, you're not going to change this person pretty much if they're over the age of 25, their frontal lobe is developed. They're not going to change. So I don't know why you're, you're kind of like nailing in the coffin to say, well, you should think like me. It's okay. If someone doesn't think like you, it's, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. I never understood that. It's crazy. So now you mentioned you bartend. So tell us about that. How did you get interested in that? And what kind of experiences have you seen since you started doing that? I feel like it's the typical Hollywood story. You know, like I I moved down, I got the internship. 
with Playboy Radio. And obviously I wanted to be Howard Stern. I wanted to be a famous radio person, but that's really difficult. It's one in a million. It's hard to do. And so to pay the bills, I started serving and bartending. Um, and it's fun. Like, it's weird. It started as something I was, you know, a little embarrassed in LA when I was young. Cause I was like, oh no, I'm in radio, you know, but I was, I wasn't making money in radio. So that wasn't the reality. The reality was I was trying to make it in radio, but to pay the bills, I was serving and bartending. So, and now it's come full circle 20 years later. I really love to bartend. I love to serve. It's kind of similar to radio in my opinion, because you're talking to new people. You're meeting lots of new people. I want to make sure they have fun. They laugh. They have a good experience. So it's just a lot of back and forth banter. And the tips are good. I like going home with money that day. It makes it feel like a fulfilling day. And, you know, you don't know who you're going to meet too. So it's not stagnant. I tried a PR firm for a year. I am not an office cubicle girl. That is not my thing. I love that I like bartending. It's like, I don't know who's going to walk in that door, what they're going to order, what their life story is. It's uh, ever changing. So do you have any like life stories that you can learn from some of your like, like the customers that you've, that you've served before? I would say it's just a lot of old men that are lonely is like the main uh, theme, which some of them, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Some of them are war heroes. I love the vets and they come in and they tell you the war stories. Cause I, I do mostly days. And so it's like an older crowd nowadays. It's not younger. And they're in their sixties or seventies and um, they just don't want to go home alone. And then the sad ones that's really common are the ones where their wives died. You know, they had like a love of the life. That was it. They were with her for 30, 40 years and she died and they don't want to be alone too. So they're going to sit at the bar and they're going to talk about the love of their life the whole time. And it's really cute because they really don't want to move on. They don't want to date. They're just like reliving the good memories with their ex-wife. So now I'll go back to politics. Have you heard about the, the $20 wage, the $20 hour wage law that was passed this year in California? Yes. I'm I'm in the wrong profession. Apparently, I need to not be bartending. I guess where the money's at is McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I used to think when I I have my kids and I'm like, yeah, you know, you want to get your first job at McDonald's or Taco Bell, but apparently that could be a career changing move for them now. I just obviously with anything, when you increase the wage, you're going to increase the food. It's gonna it's a ripple effect, right? Of increasing everything, and why are we paying that much money? I just think, I don't know. I think it's crazy. Like it is a bummer. Rent's gone up and mortgages have gone up. But also there's a lot of careers where you can make more money. Like fast food to me is supposed to be just that fast and easy. I'm not looking for gourmet. I'm late somewhere. I'm going to run through and get a burger. I want to try to keep it affordable. It's gone up so much because of the wage increase for fast food workers. Well, that's and that. And then a lot of now, a lot of the like older establishments are closing down because of that issue. Yeah, they can't afford to pay their employees because they're not a big corporation, you know, then the corporate, they have fallback. So if financially they're not doing good, they can get another loan, you know, and they can get help. But the mom and pop shops and restaurants, they don't have that kind of money to up their minimum wage and compete with the fast food restaurants, you know, and I'll be honest, I love tips and that's like where I make my money. So hourly, they don't pay well in bartending and serving, but we can walk away with good money and tips. So tip your bartenders. <laughs> how many, how, how much tip do you make throughout the, like the one eight hour job you do or however long you go on for? So it depends, but it's anywhere from 150 to 400, depending on who walks in. Randomly Mother's Day was phenomenal. And I didn't even think about that. I was scheduled to work, but only till 5 p.m. And I was like, oh, that's fine. You know, I'll pick up the kids after. And everyone was like, you're a mom. And I was like, yeah. So they just kept throwing me money. And I was like, Psh. I got to work on Mother's Day every year. Apparently, that's like the secret sauce to getting paid. So I just made a lot of money. I bought some beers and paid my car off more. So adulting. That's nice. How much did you make that day? I made five sixty. Oh, wow. And just tips. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Because I don't get paid paid hourly for a couple of weeks. But yeah, so that was. But that's rare. That's not like a norm. So how much do you get paid an hourly at the, at the job you do at? bartending not that 16 much. 16 bucks you know the minimum wage and so nobody does it for that like i said we do the tips we do fast money that we get cash and you know we go home and um and then it's kind of cool though because randomly like 
a $300, $400 will hit your account. And you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot that I'm like hourly in it, too. That's cool. You know, I'll go get some groceries for the day in California. That's what that'll do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what kind of what's your favorite drinks to make as a bartender? You know, what's funny? Not complicated ones, right? I would say the secret to people, I know if you want to go out and you want to get your mojito or your Long Island or your Moscow mule or your martini, it's cute, right? And it's fun to make cute drinks. And when I'm younger, I think it was exciting to learn them and make them. But when you're older and you're busy and you're packed and someone's like, I want this super complicated drink that's your special on the menu, it's going to take a long time. And then I'm going to have to go wash and clean the shaker out. So I would love to, just a wine or beer or if someone gets their whiskey neat, you know, whiskey sour, something that's like pretty simple and quick to make. Not when someone's like, I want an eight ingredient drink. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's going to take me away. <laughs> do you sometimes give it to the other bartender that's uh, probably there helping you out? Like you're going to do, can you like make drink for, for that customer or you have to do it? So... You really shouldn't. So if I'm taking a table, because sometimes I'm out and I'm taking a table, I can put it in the computer and it'll pop up on the screen and someone else can make it. So it's better if someone orders something difficult and you're out on the tables, then you can just put it in the screen. But I think it's kind of rude to like send it off to somebody else. Like you should, unless you see one of us swamped, then we'll help the other person out. And there's bar backs, but only on the nighttime shifts, which I do once in a while. I'm doing that. Saturday night, but it's pretty rare because I'm like a day person. That's my, I feel the best in the day and nighttime. I start getting sleepy and out of it. I'm, so. I'm with you on that. I'm a day person as well. Yeah. I'm a morning person. Like I wake up refreshed at five 30 in the morning. I grab my coffee. I cook breakfast around 6 PM. I literally start to like decompress. I start to get sleepy and I'm just not, I'm not as social. I'm, 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 I'm the same way. Like, yeah. Like I used to do shows in the afternoon around like three, four o'clock. I like, I'm not doing that anymore. 10, 10 a.m., 9 and 10 is my ideal time to do a show because that's when I'm like focused and like I can talk to someone. You could, if I had you on in the afternoon, mm -mm, I would have been very quiet. Same. I'm in my recliner, you know, around 3.30 p.m. And I'm definitely feeling a little sleepy. And I'm just I'm on my Netflix and chill time and. I, I feel the best in the morning too. Like I would love to have everyone come in on the morning. I'm working with everyone's schedules. So I got bummed this one band had to come on at like 8 p.m. the other night. And I'm just like, dude, I'm tired. I'm going to try. I like had, you know, some coffee to try to wake me up. But I'm not as mentally um, stimulating at night. I'm much better. I'm a morning radio person for sure. Same with me. Same with me. So now going back to your um. I was reading your YouTube bio and it said you had a rock and roll journalist background. So how did that get started? And how did, after you graduated college, I know you got the intern job at Playboy Radio, but did you do anything before that, before you got that Playboy Radio job? Not really. No. Um, I mean, I networked. And so in college, I met two guys that ended up getting into the music industry randomly, you know, that I went to Pacific with, Will and Aiden. So I say they were getting in because they were a couple years older than me. And so I was getting sent on these little projects for SMN News and Will was managing a lot of bands. So on these like little tiny projects um, for SMNNews.com and like interviewing bands, but just kind of in person, literally with a pen and paper where I was asking them questions and taking notes and then sending it back and then this other guy started this really small hard rock radio live where it was just like this cool, not a lot of people were doing live shows in 2007, 2008. And he was having me kind of same thing going and interviewing some people, but very minor, very minor things. I think Playboy Radio is where I started networking and started my own Stephanie's Rock Show website from there and kind of got heavy into it with my own platform. Mm -hmm. So how did you get this opportunity at Playboy Radio and what were your responsibilities at that job as an intern? Honestly, this is funny. Uh, Craigslist. Craigslist. So um, my buddy Scott had already moved to L.A. six months prior and he told well, Santa Monica. And so he's like, I want you to move down. And I'd wanted to go to L.A. That was a thing. So I was looking for jobs on Craigslist. Well, there was a Craigslist ad to come on to Playboy Radio. And it was like, can a bunny tell a funny? And it was like cute girls to try to make people laugh. 
I'm like, okay, why don't I try out for that? And uh, I've done small comedy hosting gigs and stuff like that. Comedy is really hard. I could never do it, but I, I love doing like a two minute comedy set to introduce somebody. And so I went down, they said I did great. And they're like, we're looking for an intern. And I'm like, I literally just graduated. Let's do this. And that's where I found out in the waiting room when I'm making coffee and I'm helping out and doing things, I'm coming across all of these comedians and rockers and producers that I'm like, why don't I make little Vista print cheap, you know, cards and say, do you want to come on my rock show that doesn't exist? It didn't even exist. There was no show. I just made these business cards and like these huge people were like, yeah, I want to come on. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to get a camera and a mic and I'm going to have to have this show exist. So I was like booking celebrities before I even had the equipment to like do this show. And it, it just ended up being really fun and working out. But it was funny that I was like, oh yeah, you know? And then I met Tracy Weedman. I got to give a shout out to her. She is Marilyn Manson, Megadeth, Foreigner Sticks, Kansas, Joan Jett. She is the manager for a lot of incredible acts. And she's like, do you want to come on the road sometimes and get some footage and interview some people? So she definitely got me in the door to get some awesome bands and get kind of just my feet wet on like, what am I, what am I asking? What am I doing? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I, when I started my show, I didn't know all any of that. I didn't know, I didn't know anyone. I just did it on my own. And like I said, I just went from there and it's been an interesting experience for me. In That's cool. Yeah. That takes guts though. I'm glad you did it and started it because it's scary for anyone to start their own show. And what if someone comes across it? I'm like, and they're like, it sucks. You know, people have said that about my show. And when I was younger, I was like, oh no, I need to ask more questions and they need to be better. And now that I'm older, I'm like, no, no, F you. My show's cool because it's my show and I can do whatever I want. And you don't even have a show. So why are you talking shit on my show? That's kind of I'm weird. glad I don't get like feedback from anyone. I do my own thing. I never got any feedback from anyone that's listened to my show, which I'm kind of thankful for because it like gives my mindset. Like I don't need to really listen to what you have to say anyways. I'm going to do it on my own. Yeah, that's cool. And then like we talked about it even before we started, just kind of having the confidence and not being afraid to be who you are truly and say how you feel. A lot of people have a problem with that. They want to mask or pretend to be a better version of themselves or someone they're not, or they're afraid to even get their thoughts out loud. And that's sad. You know, like, does it, we have a short amount of time on the spinning rock. Like if it makes you happy to talk about your views or interview people, then do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what kind of experience did you learn from that Playboy radio intern job you had? Definitely a lot. Um, one, when I was young, I was like, oh, I made it right. Like I'm going to be Howard Stern next week. And then I realized, oh, there's not a job coming out of this, right? Like there's not an opening position. I thought for sure after it, I'd get an open position. I'd be permanently on air. There was no position offered. So I went from, oh, I'm, I'm going to make it to, oh gosh, I'm not going to make it. I got to figure things out for myself. Um, and I just, I kept bartending. I kept hustling. I would do all these Craigslist jobs too, where I would backup dance I would be in music videos. I'd be in extra and commercials just to try to pay the rent, you know, and go around. And I knew I wanted to get back in radio, but I don't think people understand how difficult radio isn't something you find. It kind of finds you. And I finally ended up on a morning show, but it took a long time of me bouncing around and doing my own project of someone reaching out and talking to me. It's not like you bust open the doors of a radio station and you're like, so I'm kind of cool at talking shit and interviewing people. And I keep up to date with current events. Can I come on your show? That's like not how it works, but it was a good eye opening experience of damn, I'm not going to be famous overnight. I'm going to have to hustle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what kind of interesting stories or experiences from the Playboy radio intern job that you learned or anything that you did after that? I would say more kind of my own show, like from there bouncing off and handing out the cards. And I, um, I met the director of the hangover and we dated for a little bit, Todd Phillips. So he, it was like my first really famous, well-known person. And he kind of taught me the ins and outs of LA and told me stories that I just remember being like, this guy is really cool. And I dated Joe Francis of Girls Gone Wild and he was inviting me to his mansion and flying me out for his parties and 
Then I dated the drummer of Slipknot, Joey Jordison, and he got me super connected into the rock world, you know, rest in peace. And so I think like, it was fun. Like I just got into the little Hollywood circle for a while, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I was dating these people that were well-connected, that were giving me advice and teaching me things. And I was hanging out with famous people in the house and trying to pretend like it was no big deal. Like, oh yeah, we're just having a beer, you know, with Marilyn Manson and John five. And that's just, this is the Sunday afternoon at Joey's, but it was really cool for me. Like really. And then I did get used to it though. I feel like I got in the LA bubble and I got used to it. And now that I'm really removed and an old mom calmed down in Sacramento, I'll look back or I'll tell someone a story like, oh, something will come up in conversation. And I'm like, I know that producer. They're like, what? And I'm like, okay, it actually was more unique and cooler than I thought it was. So going back to the Girls Gone Wild guy, how was his parties like? It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And thinking back, it was wild. I was 18 and he was 36 when we first started dating, which is wild. And so... You know, I was very impressed because he was friends with the Kardashians and Paris Hilton. And those were very well-known, uh, popular people. Um, Joe, I'll be honest, has always been nice to me. But I was around a lot of degrading behavior in the room and whatnot, you know. And there was girls, though, was wild, begging to be on Girls Gone Wild. I don't understand it because I'm like, why would you want to not get paid? be on a video that goes out to lots of people and they were beg and they, they would drink a lot on their own accord bag and want to be on the show. So we would be setting up cameras and clubs and different things. And it was, it was mayhem though. Literally it was fun, but it was absolutely, I was drinking a lot. I was partying hard. I was deep in the rage. I'd say 18 to 25, those ages. If there was, a drink or a drug near me. I'm like, let's do it all. Let's have orgies. It was just, it was like fun. It was like, I don't regret it, but I definitely had an insanely wild time. Like, thank God I'm alive. I was like that. It was crazy. So you took all the drugs that they had, like Molly, all the hardcore ones. So Molly wasn't even a thing at that, at that stage. So it wasn't even anything called Mother's Ecstasy. And uh, yeah, every kind of pill, um, every, every acid and weed and any kind of drug there was. I've always been a curious person, like literally in general. If there's something to research, I'll go down the rabbit hole of researching that topic. So I knew if something was going to be offered to me, I had to try it. I never liked drugs. Yes, I never I never was like, oh, I had a great time because I did drugs. I, I watched people around me that like to buy drugs and do it often. And I was always perplexed because I didn't like them. But I will try everything once. And I like to drink. I mean, I'm, I'm having a beer now. I definitely like some alcohol, but not even a lot in that, too. I'm not like a hard liquor person. What I love is fun, like being around madness and wild and fun and almost like being a researcher and like blending into the group I was in to watch people do crazy shit. Like I liked being at the party, if that makes sense, and not partying insanely hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now going back to the radio job you had, what, what went behind the scenes with that? Like what was your day-to-day, -day, uh, like what were you doing from like nine to five or the hours you had? Well, I would say the best to describe is when I was at 96.7 for like an actual morning job and people don't understand how difficult that is because I left the house at three in the morning and I had to be there at four, 430 to research. We went live at 5 a.m. So we did an hour to 30 minutes of research, you know, and printing out a timeline of, you know, our bullet points. Uh, this is a current event. This is a big thing in the news. This is sports update. Um, this is what we want to discuss or talk about. And so we had, you know, um, different topics to bounce around from. And then you give your all from 5 to 10 a.m. From 5 to 10 a.m., even though it's five hours, I am making sure I'm the funniest, most creative person. So by the time I'm off work at 10 a.m., I was exhausted and drained. And I had another hour to drive home. I'd get home at 11 a.m. and crash. Like just I do this weird sleep from like 11 a.m. to maybe 4 p.m. and then get up and make dinner 
and, you know, watch some shows, relax, have a little bit of a night and then go back to bed and wake up at 3 a.m. all over again. I don't think people realize like morning DJ schedule. You don't really have a life and a lot of friends because your your sleep's off and you're you're really giving 110 percent when you're on air. So now tell us about your experience in interviewing artists and going on tours with them. Which tours were your favorites and what were some of your favorite artists interview? So um, it was actually my second tour. The first one was with Smash Mouth that I ever did. And uh, the second tour was Four or Six in Kansas that Tracy connected. And that is where Maybe I'd say my favorite interview or the funniest or one of the most views is Kelly Hansen, the lead singer of Foreigner, said he shit his pants on stage when I said, what's like the wildest thing that's happened to you? And I thought it was going to be like a bra got thrown on stage or I forgot a lyric. And he took he was having you know, he was constipated for a long time traveling and he took an X-lax and it never worked. And all of a sudden on stage, it started working and he shit himself on stage performing. And I was just laughing like literally so hard. I couldn't remember the next question. I'm like, and so I made that into a short even and I put it back on my YouTube channel. And I love that he, I said, is it okay to use this? Like, I thought like, oh, he's going to regret it. He goes, no, use it. I think it's great. And so the fact that Kelly was so comfortable with reality and then in general, I absolutely love interviewing Still Panther. I just, they're so silly and funny and goofy. And we're not just interviewing, we're becoming characters and being like the wildest version of ourselves. So Satchel and, um, or, you know, Russ and Ralph are their name, but Satchel and Michael of Still Panther are just funny. And you can just, you can be the crazier version of yourself and not be afraid. Mm -hmm. So what kind of stories did you learn from each person you talked to that affected you personally, or you took it later on in life and used it like an example? That's a good question. There's probably a lot, but I... I would say in general, what I've really taken away is these huge rock stars, huge directors or huge models and porn stars, whatever, are very human. They're very shy and very insecure and um, sometimes worried about how they come off if they're, you know, uh, answering things correctly. I've learned that we're all on the same page. We're all struggling with depression and anxiety and our own mental issues. And so a lot of really famous, wealthy people that you would think like, oh, they have it all, right? They've got the fame and the money and they've been very depressed and uh, or nervous or shy. And uh, it shocked me, kind of surprised me. Mm -hmm. So when you were doing these interviews, were you allowed to write your own questions? Or did, if you were working with like a radio company, did they give you the questions to like ask the artist? So a little bit of both, you know, when I did my own Steph's Rock Show, of course, that's all of my questions on my own. Um, when I did side projects for SMN News or I was with um, Hey Rock um, and uh, Rock 96.7, they would say, hey, we want this album brought up, right? Like or the band would have a plug that okay, this is the day the EP or the single comes out, or this is the festival coming up. So make sure and work that in the interview. But they would never give me like a straight up question, you know, that you're pretty much on your own for all of the questions. And then you would want to make sure and sneak in their um, advertisement or promotion that they wanted to be in there. Mm -hmm. So, so this is probably you're going to relate to the question about to ask you, why do so many media outlet outlets ask vague or lame questions to when they're interviewing like like and it could be anyone like band member like actor actress why do you think so many media outlets just like ask them really ridiculous questions i think sometimes we're afraid so sometimes we have pr companies that contact us that say you know don't ask anything too crazy or we're going to ask you to take it down like i've been asked to take down a couple interviews because i asked very uh personal questions and the artist answered it honestly and i loved them i'm like oh this is a good interview and then the pr firms or, or managers have seen them and said hey you have to take this down or we will sue so i've been bummed i've, I've taken down with asking alexandria and uh black phil brides two very personal um, interviews at the rainbow. And they talked about insanely personal. I think they drank a little too much before the interviews. Um, so we are afraid 
that will get in trouble or people won't want to work with you if you ask like too edgy of questions. But then there's a fine line, right? Because I don't want to be bored. So I want to be silly. I want to be goofy. Sometimes I love the sexual questions to throw somebody off. It's like my little gist. But I also want to make sure I'm able to book artists in the future. So I kind of get when some people, especially on major networks, have to play it safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't play that game at all. I, yeah, I I don't play that game at all. I ask the questions that come to my mind because I do research about the uh, artist or anyone I'm bringing on. But after that, it's a free flowing. I'm going to ask them anything I desire because that's where you get that's where they open up more and you get to know their, like, their personal lives a little bit more. So then people can stop like judging them, like how they truly are. And they just, yeah. just here's the thing I noticed with like some fans, some fans think that they just like are like focused on music and that's it. They, a lot of these people have other lives outside of music and not a lot of people know about. So on my show, it's just, that's what I try to do when I bring artists on, like talk about your music, but also talk about a little about your personal life so people can like, like get both sides of your story. That's cool. Yeah, no, I dig that. And it's the freedom of having independent podcasts. And I love that I have that too. I don't have a company after me or anyone saying like, don't cast or don't talk about your political beliefs. I can talk about whatever I want, you know, because I'm not getting paid. I'm monetized, but on YouTube, I think I'll make a dollar to $4 a month. You know, I'm rolling in the dough on my monetization. And so I'm not worried. Yeah, I don't make that much. I only make it through my listener base, which is speaker. I make like, I mean, $10 the first month in January and it's been only like three dollars because I turn on ads on speaker that's the only way I, I'm making some monetization from that. yeah yeah I mean I'm hoping like right in a year I'm hoping it makes like 20 to 30 bucks like a little bit more maybe I could get a new mic or something but this is my prop my hobby you know my side project that's not paying the bills but it's really fun and it's been great to just oh, I love this band. I wonder if they'll want to come on. They do. Oh my gosh, this new band that I'm listening to their music, I get to talk to. I get just stoked that that can happen still. Mm -hmm. So now what challenges have you faced in your career and what did you do to overcome them? Definitely the kids. I'll be honest, the kids, um, it's all planned, right? So it's difficult. I kind of did this to myself. I really wanted to leave LA and go back towards Northern California and settle down and get married and start a family. I knew I didn't want to have kids in Hollywood. It's just not the place I think you should raise kids. So I got married and started my family. I thought it would be easier to get back into radio. I didn't realize it's really difficult. Um, I got divorced. And so it's not like I have a partner, but my partner also works out of town. So it wouldn't have kind of made a difference. But there's no daycares open between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning to watch your kids or take them to school. I don't have like a mom or dad or grandparents that can help out. So kind of thinking like, oh, I'll be a mom. I'll have a couple kids. And then when they're at an older age or not baby babies, I'll go back into radio. And it's been extremely difficult. And I got offered a job like in 2018. And I was so kind of set back when I couldn't just jump on board back into a morning show um, things are better because they're both in school now. So I would love to do like an afternoon show or something, but yeah, I would love to get back into radio. That would be the goal. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there a reason why a lot of these like, uh, actors and actors are moving out of California because they don't want to raise kids here in the state? Cause I know, for example, Mark Wahlberg decided to like completely move out of the state and move to Nevada to raise his kids properly. Do you think that's the reason why? I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, Wyoming, even Montana, you know, yeah, Nevada, Utah, they're all locating. My girlfriend uh, moved to Utah from Hollywood and had three kids. Um, price, economy, everything's really expensive here. And it's not like we're making that much money work wise. Um, the government started having more say and control of what you do with your children, which is just silly to me. Like, no, mm -hmm. if you're the mom and dad and you're doing your job properly, you should be able to raise your kids, not the government. So there's a lot of reasons. Like I said, I still love California. I don't think I'd ever leave it. Um, I think Northern California is smaller. It's more affordable and it's a better place to raise kids. Um, I love LA though. I'll always visit LA and take the kids down there and visit people. But um, I don't see it as like a kid friendly place. It's a fun playground for adults. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now tell us about your podcast and show you do on YouTube called Steph Rock Show. What is that about? So, wow, I started Steph's Rock Show in 2008. 
Um, I don't have a website anymore, but I still, I have the YouTube and, um, I just started stuff's rock show again as a podcast on Spotify and Instagram. And I absolutely love it. This has just always been my favorite hobby. So I interview musicians. I'm starting to interview reality stars. Also some of my friends that have businesses locally that want to come on and just talk about it. If I have an idea that pops through my head, it's so healthy for me to get it off my chest and talk about it. I like listening to other podcasts. Um, so sometimes I'll get inspired from another podcast and want to talk. And so Steph's rock show is just about fun, fun, music, rock, life, everything. And everyone's welcomed on. If anyone's listening to this, you want to come on Steph's rock show, DM me. I love meeting new people. Yeah. Same with me. If you want to do it, come on my show. My DMs are always open on my Instagram. I dig that. Mm -hmm. So who's been your favorite guest so far on your show since you started the show back on YouTube? The new show, but I, honestly, Big Ed, I was shocked when I contacted Big Ed, like, do you want to come on the new show? And he's like, yes, right away. I'm like, no way. I'm dreaming. Why? Like, he's on so many reality shows on TLC. He's such a huge person that he doesn't need to come on my little tiny new podcast that just started up. But he was so cool and grateful and easy to interview. So that was really fun and exciting. And then, um, Michael Starr of Steel Panther, I think because he came on Steph's Rock Show in 2009. So the fact that he came back on the Rock Show, but as a podcast in 2024, and we're still friends and we still catch up was a neat like, wow, we've grown up. We've we've aged quite a bit, but we're still we're still doing what we like. So I thought that was kind of neat. So do you have any goals for your podcast this year that you'd like to achieve? I love that question. Um, I want to get back into radio, you know, I either, or, or I want this podcast to continue to expand. It's only been about six weeks. So more followers, more likes, um, more interesting guests that want to come on, um, to get the podcast huge up and running and larger, and then hopefully maybe jump on a station nearby, even if it's just for a little bit, like here and there. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare yourself mentally before interviewing a guest? Do you have like a thing you do before you have someone come on your show and you need to interview them? No, should I? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I will say sometimes I like a beer or a glass of wine. It kind of relaxes me. I'm um hyperactive person. I'm always thinking. That's why I'm good at questions because I'm like, oh, that makes me think of a question I'm going to ask. So to calm me down a little bit, maybe a little drink. Um, my life is so busy though. I don't even have extra time before the interviews or the, like before even meeting you, I drive an hour and a half to drop two kids off at two different schools and get them breakfast. I drive home. I jog my dog. I'll try to literally update my page for a second and then like do an interview, clean, get the kids and go to baseball right now. It's baseball season. So we're in basketball, baseball, soccer. So run to a sporting event, work on the page while I'm at the sporting event. But, uh, I don't have a ton of downtime. Like I will be on the page a lot, but I'll seriously be like at the school in my car running around and I'll be like, yeah, oh yeah, I want to respond back to that. But I don't have, do you have, do you do something before the shows that helps you or collect your thoughts? No, no. I just yeah. try to calm down because when before we came on, I was like, I was very nervous. I get nervous. Yeah, that's normal. I get nervous for every guest that, that's come on my show that, if I know them well, then it's fine. But if I don't know the person at all, then it's a different story that there's been a few times I messed up with my intro, but I've like quickly caught on to like, I just slow down and do the intro properly and then do the show because there's, there's one time that one guest I had on from, um, infected rain, that was not a good experience for me personally. It got off to a really bad start. Yeah. And then it, and then her impression of me kind of, kind of got sour. Oh, bummer. Yeah. I pronounced well, the band's we, name we, wrong one time because I got nervous in the intro and I pronounced their name wrong and I was like, oh, I fucked up. And then at same, I felt like the whole interview was off because I could tell the band was upset that I pronounced their name wrong, but I didn't mean to. Yeah, the same thing happened to me with her. Oh, damn it. But yeah. we still did the, it was still, it's still the show when uh, we still did the show. But after I, after I got off with her, I was like thinking, shit, I messed up badly. But, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I know, like, we can be more critical and our, you know, best judge is ourself. But it's really not a huge deal. Some people can't even talk to someone they don't know at all like this on a podcast and carry on a conversation. So if you pronounce something wrong or, you know, what we can't be, I'll realize, like, starting this new podcast, I'm saying awesome. 
I don't, I didn't do that in radio. I didn't do that like years ago. So I don't know where this came from, I guess, ever since becoming an old mom. Now I'm just like, that's awesome. Awesome. Bam. You're awesome. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to mentally tell myself, like, don't just say awesome, say other words. I don't, but that happens, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's say now you never got the radio job at your university and didn't, and never got that playboy internship and all that stuff. Did you have anything else in mind that you wanted to pursue as a career? That's not like, well, so before radio, I entered as the teacher ed education. And I think being a teacher, I knew I wanted to be a mom one day. I've always had a lot of animals, a lot of dogs and cats. I'm such a caretaker. So I knew in some route, I wanted to either work with kids or have kids. I love taking care of things in general. It brings me a lot of joy to be like, oh, you're happy. You're fed. You're taken care of. Like I did something today. So anything to like work with kids, elderly too. I used to tap dance in uh, convalescent homes. So like seeing the older people light up when you perform and tap dance, because tap was like really big in the thirties and forties. And so, um, I don't know, J getting the joy, working with people that need help would have been, or it still is pretty cool, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a similar career as yours? God, don't do it. It's it's hard. It's a hard dream, right? It's like acting or modeling, um, podcasting, journalism, everything. It's it's not like where uh, bartending, where I walk into a bar and I go, "Hey, man, I got 16 years of experience. Want to watch me make something? Boom, you got the job, right? Like it's the, a lot of people need you. A lot of people don't need those in the entertainment industry, so it's very difficult to make it. Um, you know, you got something magical, you got something special. It's great. Have fun with it on your own. I'd say with low expectations or no expectations. Mm -hmm. So now what are some of your favorite movies to watch and why? Oh, that's a good one. Cause I love movies and I love music, anything entertainment. Definitely. I I'm going to say top five, the Rocky horror picture show. It's a cult classic. I opened it as a burlesque performer as Trixie in LA and Sacramento. Um, love Tim Curry. Then Labyrinth, uh, David Bowie, like David Bowie and the Pants and Labyrinth, an 80s classic with Jim Henson. Such a great film. I like to get lost in that film. And then Closer, that one's not as popular. And it's newer with Natalie Portman and Jude Law, if you've seen it. And it is such a raw, incredible uh, story about lives that I think is real and relationships. Um, then Almost Famous. Because I felt like I was Penny Lane growing up. I love Cameron Crowe. And she was a little groupie band-aid that traveled with the bands and just but fell in love too. I felt like not only was I groupie, but I literally would fall in love. I'd like, this is it. We're getting married. This is my world. I was such a little lover girl. And then let's see. So Rocky Horror Lab. Oh, and then Dark Crystal. That's a Dark Crystal, another Jim Henson. 80s fantasy, I totally dig. And like jumping into a world of creation and magic that's not real, but getting lost in it. I love that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch any horror movies? Are you into, are you into horror movies? Yes. So it was, I was really into horror movies when I was younger. Like that's all I watched. I was into heavy metal and horror movies and I went to Hot Topic and I was like a little goth punk girl, you know? So that was like the shit. I loved Scream. I loved Nightmare on Elm Street and, you know, all the Fred, yeah, the Michaels, all the classics. And then Chucky, like Bride of Chucky. I got so into that. Um, I don't rewatch horror films and I'll be honest lately, I haven't been super scared and into the newer horror films. Um, it too was like the last thing that I saw in IMAX that I jumped that kind of actually scared me again. But, um, I don't nowadays, but I used to just be, oh, horror flicks and chill. That was, that was a jam, you know, but now now, and I'm into reality shows. I'm into Netflix binge watching. That's the jam nowadays. All the, the shitty trash TV, I'm into that. So what are some of your favorite uh, Netflix shows to watch or reality TV shows to, that you enjoy watching? Definitely Vanderpump Rules, Love is Blind, Married at First Sight, um, Love After Lockup. So anything where you're falling in love and the odds are against you and it's just like, oh, this is going to explode. This is a train wreck or dynamite. I, I love those shows. And then documentaries. Two like really cool documentaries that go in depth about things, um, prisons and jails and drugs 
and yeah, how the those, world was I'm, created. Yeah, I'm into those kinds of documentaries as well. Me too, like Vice documentaries and TED Talks. Mm-hmm. Like, I love those. Did you ever watch that show on Netflix, oh, The Toughest Prison? I forgot what the title of the show is. Is a former, uh, I think he's from Britain. He's a former prisoner and he goes to, around the world to these diff, different tough pr- prisons and just see how people live in it. It's like, oh, that's like mind blowing. Yes. Yeah, I have. And I just, I think I've always been fascinated by the prison system. It's different around the world, so different. And it's so corrupt. And there's so many problems with it in America. And as much as it's like bad guys should be locked up, it's sometimes just worse than what we think or they think of as animals. But yeah, I'm I'm really fascinated by the prison system. And I don't know. There's this new one that just came out in Arkansas where they let them have more freedom and kind of run the prison on their own. And that went better than I expected. You just uh, did you also know that in Sweden they do the same thing? Sweden, yeah, they let they let their prisoners run their own like uh, commune area, and it's like more like it's more less stress on them, and the cops don't have to like intervene because they already know how they are like running the prison, like their own like area on their own. It gives them more self confidence to mm-hmm. have the freedom, and I think it's better. The Swedish and the Finnish, I think, have it together as far as like lower crime rates usually and nicer prison systems, and they're smart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, do you like to read? I do like to read. I have a problem though. I'm narcoleptic. I joke, but I'm serious. I fall asleep. So I read more when I was younger and I could stay awake and get into it. But in the last couple of years, when I go to read, I just pass out like instantly. Do you like to read? I used to. I did read like all last year and then I can't get into books anymore because either I lose track, especially with audiobooks. If I listen to the audiobook, I got to listen to it all the way through. If I stop, I'm going to lose interest and I never actually going to go back to it. Yeah. What did I just, the last I read was the trilogy, A Court of Thorn and Roses, and it was like fairy porn. And I tried to get into it because everyone was like, this is the hip new, this is going to be the new Twilight, you know? And I just wasn't that into it. It was not as sexual as I thought everyone was making out to be. It was a slow start. And I, I'm i not as into reading as like my 20s. I was really into reading. And now it's, I'd rather honestly watch a TED Talk than read a book. I'm I'm, I'm the same way. So going back to trash uh, reality TV, did you ever watch The Bachelor? Yeah, I used to. I haven't recently um, because I I did away with cable. So anything kind of just on Netflix, you know, or YouTube premium, I'll catch up on. But I I don't watch The Bachelor now recently. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had to be trapped in a TV show for a month, which show would you choose and why? That's a great question. Um, I almost want to say Vanderpump Rules because... So I lived in LA and I went to Sir. I've served and bartended before. And I used to talk to Jax for a little bit that was on the show. So I feel like I know one of them. I know how their jobs work. I know everything about them. It would be a fun kind of easy jump in. So now what is your favorite genre of music to listen to? That's hard because I am so diverse in all my genres. And I will say I still love rock and metal. I'd say that's my go-to. But recently, I've been loving the new country. I have just, which is surprising for me. I like rap, though. I like hip-hop. I like country. Um, I kind of, like it depends how I wake up that day and what I'm feeling for what I want to go for. So what are some of your bands that you like uh, that you enjoy listening to? Uh, Motionless and White. Marilyn Manson, Weird Al, which is funny. David Bowie and Jimi Hendrix, rest in peace. Um, newer is Two Feet and Hippie Sabotage. They're like these slow, kind of sexy, fun rock. Um, a Morgan Wallen for country. He's got those, you want to drink a beer to him and he fucked up again and I want to listen to that. Jelly Roll, uh, Yellow Wolf, um, Mickey Avalon, like party music. Um, getting ready for work. I like E40, like some kind of hyphy rap music to get me pumped. Of like, I'm going. It's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. So speaking of Weird, uh, uh, Weird Al, did you have a story about that? I saw you post it on your Instagram page. Yeah, I love sharing it because now that this is a new podcast, I think there's a lot of people that haven't heard the Weird Al story. But I've said it so much you know, like over the years on the radio shows. But It was just the wildest turn of events that I'm kind of proud of myself at just 13 writing all those um, 
daytime talk shows to meet Weird Al. And how ridiculous is that, right? Like who thinks that they're going to read the email and fly you out to meet the person you want to meet? And Donnie and Marie Osmond, bless them, and their producer Barry flew me out and gave me a whole like 10 minutes on the show to meet Al, talk to him, give him gifts. And then we had a dance off. And then, yeah, I got to backup dance for him. I literally wanted to marry him though. Like it was really embarrassing. Like 13 year old nerdy stuff with braces was like, let's do, let's get married. And he's like, no, like you're underage. This is not okay. And I'm like, so embarrassed now that I did that, but it's kind of funny too. And then yes, so I interviewed him years later at South by Southwest and I was embarrassed. I had Bermuda, his drummer first, and then I had Jim West and I was like, oh, he's not going to remember me. Like he has thousands, millions of fans worldwide. Weird Al is so cool. And I was so embarrassed that he remembered me because I was like legit creepy fan. Like I, I was like, we need to end up together. That was where my headset was at that age, you know, because you it was like my first crush growing up. Mm -hmm. How many celebrities have you met throughout your like radio gig and all all your things you've done in your life? I have no clue. A lot. Like how many, how many, like if you had to like put a number to it? Well, I mean, and just on radio or like phoners into the station or just partying. Any, however you want to answer the question. I would say thousands if we're going to talk about like celebrities calling into the stations or me meeting them for an interview or me just partying at someone's house. I mean, definitely thousands. I don't who was, know. Who was your favorite Um, uh, when they called in the radio? Who was your favorite person like to speak with? Good point. Um, there's been so many. Um, I would say it was really cool when uh, Dio called in because he's no longer with us. That's one that stands out because he had already been diagnosed with cancer and it was like 2010. He had done the Golden God Awards and Dio called in and he was so nice and it, it, he's just a rock god like a complete legend so to be able to interview him and you know he had to kind of speak slowly and I was just hanging on for every word to like ask him questions but that was a career defining moment I would say mm -hmm. so you did radio what else what other things did you do and the dancing what else did you do in like between the radio gigs so I did burlesque at Crazy Girls, which um, is still open. I was kind of shocked. I just I looked it up a year ago. Tell, and us, tell us about that a little more. What, what, were you, what were you doing during that time? So it was really fun. So not only I did Expose in Austin, Texas and Crazy Girls, and I just did a little show about it because I think people were shocked that Dorothy, that's now in a band called Dorothy and Kara Marie from MTV The Challenge were there at that time as well. And it was neat. It was so we had to wear like pasties and bottoms. So no one was like fully nude, but they served alcohol and it was a great performance, you know, bar. So you could come grab a drink on Wednesdays. It was rock and roll Wednesdays, which were my favorite. So they'd have a new band every Wednesday up on stage and you got to dance and perform and do the splits and whatever you wanted to do around this band. So it was also like famous people, producers and rappers would come into Crazy Girls and it was a cool hub to network and kind of bounce off. But I made a lot of money doing burlesque in three different clubs um, across the U.S. And so I kind of always I would like have my toe in burlesque. I'd have my toe in radio. Then I'd have my toe in just serving or bartending. Sometimes I'd kind of be and then on Craigslist saying yes to every job that came my way, like all those Doritos commercial jobs <laughs> that were always up. I'm like, yes, I'll do that. How many of those jobs did you end up getting those commercial jobs? Oh, pretty much everything. But, you know, as an extra, I didn't have like, you know, oh, I did. I did date my mom, though. And next, like remember those funny reality shows a long time ago on MTV. Um, those are the only things I got like main speaking. I didn't have um, any like huge parts. I was always just like part of the crowd. I was in a pool. I was, you know. And if people live in LA, you it's natural, right? Like I think it's people in Sacramento are like, what? You're in the background of an Aquafina commercial? And I'm like, yeah, in LA, I needed to pay the rent. So they needed like 200 people at this place at this time. So I'd show up and get paid. You know, to, I did whatever was available at that time. So what was your favorite job to do from that commercial? Ooh, from the, it's definitely, I don't know 
it was like these rappers and I don't even know they were a big deal. And I don't know who they were, but they were doing a commercial, these rappers. And I just thought it was really funny because it was not something I was used to. And I'm so glad my girlfriend, Alara, one of my best friends in LA did it with me. And these girls were all going nuts over these rappers, like literally freaking out. And we don't know who they are. And so we're also kind of the only white girls, for some, you know, and so they're freaking out. And then they're going in the bathroom and they're hooking up with all these rappers. And then they're coming out and bragging about it. And just then they start hooking up with them out by the pool on the commercial. And the, when they all cut and we're taking a break. And so it was just kind of ironic and crazy. Everyone was drunk and it was just like a commercial shot. But in trying to bang these rappers that I still I don't know who they were, but it was wild. Mm -hmm. So you did the commercial. Anything else you did? Like a lot of little projects. You know, like a lot of, I was Miss San Joaquin County and uh, in Miss California pageant uh, 2004. And so I got to travel and represent for a year at the county and um, hang out with Miss California and then just like uh, dance and like catalogs, you know, like little modeling catalogs for like Mervyn's and Walmart and little, like I just did a bunch of little projects. Like since I was young, um, I backup dance for Mr. Fab in the He's Sick music video. Um, I backup dance for a lot of like little artists at the Roxy and Sunset. So there's just so many. Like I'd have to sit down and like write down all my small entertainment projects of what I've done. It's just kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. So now what was your first ever concert you attended? So with my parents, Weird Al. Like I said, like I literally Weird Al was life and God. Like I worshipped his albums. I owned every single album and I had all of his posters up in my room. And I thought Weird Al and I would get married one day, you know, um, it's a bummer. I'm still, I'm still trying, you know, if he ever gets divorced, I'm next in line, but uh, Weird Al. And then, but you know how, do you ever remember like your first um, concert without your parents? I feel like that stands out more to me because I was so sheltered, but at 14, they like did they let they threw me a bone here and there and they let me go to Incubus for two hours without them. And so that to me stands out the most is like the most freedom. And I smelled people smoking weed all around me. I'd never smelled that before. So Incubus was like my <gasps> mind blown. This is so cool. I've got no parents and there's all these badass rockers around me. Mm -hmm. So let's say your life became into a movie. Which actor or actress would, would you want to play a role? as you or someone else in your life? You know what I get a lot? I get two things a lot. I get um, Sarah Michelle Gellar and Alanis Morissette. Those are the two that I get that I look like or that I look similar to. Um, I would love to play like me, Kate Hudson. And I think just because I related to Penny Lane and Almost Famous so much, and I also love her off camera. She seems very fun and relatable and I've never met her in, in real life but her interviews her energy comes off as real and authentic mm -hmm. oh and also what would you title your uh, self movie what would I title it mm -hmm. oh my gosh reckless in love because <laughs> I can be reckless and I'm always in love so I think that'd be a good title mm -hmm. so now what hobbies do you enjoy doing besides being a mom god that a lot um I like meditation. So just like deep breathing, the mind clearing, like we said, learning about unique things. So I'll just go down a YouTube rabbit hole and wind up like learning something that I didn't know existed. Um, I love my dog and cat. So just like jogging them. I love flipping houses because it's really good money. It's hard work, but learning like the market of real estate and when's a good time to buy and, you know, when's a good time to just sit still kind of like what I'm doing right now. But um, I love, I love wine, like really nice wine. So going and wine tasting. What's your favorite wine? A cab. So like a, a Napa cab is probably going to be my favorite. Sometimes a Merlot. When it warms up though, I will go for a white, a Pinot Grigio or Rosé, but just love like a nice bottle of wine or an experience of like a wine flight and cheese landing in front of you. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So now tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they affected you positively or negatively. Ooh, I'm, I got still some questions from you. I like these. Definitely my grandpa. 
Cornelius Michael Sullivan II, he was the Republican judge that um, he started the Lodi Library and it's named after him and he still has a room in there with his like judge desk and stuff. So my grandfather was a very well-known, respected figure in San Joaquin County and San Francisco. Um, he finished top of his class at Berkeley. So just walking into his office and seeing all of his framed awards and accomplishments everywhere was really cool. Or walking into a courthouse and sitting in the back and watching your grandfather up as a judge decide somebody's life and fate. I was like, wow, he's powerful and he's smart. And he was on speech and debate and boxing. He was like the hottest kid and the smartest kid. So my grandfather, you know, and he helped me get into real estate. He taught me everything I know about real estate and he helped me start the first flip. So my grandfather, I'd say, is the hugest influence in my life. Second, my best friend, Genevieve, um, very French. And we've been best friends since kindergarten, which is rare. I think a lot of people nowadays lose contact with their friends. And even though she joined the military and she's now based in Washington, D.C., we talk almost every day and we're very different. But I think that helps us get along. Like she's a doctor that's very conservative and has her life very structured. And I've always been like the fun, artsy, silly, outgoing one. So we we definitely compliment each other. And I don't really know for the, like those are my two favorite people. Um, I would say probably if I'm just completely honest, the third could be my dad. He's a complete asshole, but I'm not going to say that didn't um, inspire me or um, change who you are as a person. You know, like he's rough. He's kind of mean. Um, he's blunt. And um, a guy's guy. And I think being an only child, I definitely was raised with a tough biker dad. And that has turned me into someone that can hold their own and be in a crowd of a lot of men. And also my my asshole tendencies, I for sure have gotten from my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what is the biggest lesson you've learned in your life so far? Biggest lesson? To slow down and be more patient. And I'm still working on patience. Because I'm an Aries. I do love reading that shit. It's so interesting. And too. you too? Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. No way. What's yeah. your birthday? April 3rd. Nice. I'm April 11th. And it I, it, I used to not believe in that stuff. But the older I get, the more I read it, I go, this is making too much sense. I don't know why, I'm but it's not. It's it, not. It too. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, what? And it says our worst trait is patience. And I completely agree. I want to do it now. I want results now. I want to get my idea out now. And that's not how things work the best, right? And so for me, slowing down and knowing like it'll happen when it's supposed to happen at a certain time frame, I'm still, I'm still working on that. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the worst moment of your life and how did you handle it? I would say my parents' divorce, for sure, um, because they were married for like 22 years, but divorced when I was 18, right after I got to college. And when you're young, you don't think things affecting you, right? Or you're sweeping it under the rug. You don't know how to understand and deal with things. I do a lot of meditation and, and deep, heavy talks now, but at 18, I got heavy into drinking and experimenting with drugs because I didn't want to you know, as an only child, no siblings to talk to or open up to it. My mom ran down to Orange County and just kind of disappeared. And my dad met someone in Linden. So they both just sold the family house, didn't tell me, didn't get to say goodbye to it. My shit's packed up in a storage unit. Bam, they're done. I'm living out in college on my own. I realize I now have nowhere to go for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Or if I do, it's a boyfriend's house and a girlfriend's house. You know, so it's just like awkward. Like your whole world at 18, which you think you're an adult, but looking, I'm not, I'm a baby, got exploded. And I definitely partied hard to cover up any um, insecurity or reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you could have dinner with any three people dead or alive, who would those people be and why? Definitely David Bowie, Weird Al and Tim Curry. Like those are just the top three. And so uh, David Bowie, he is, my favorite artist, like overall, I just love that he was androgynous and did makeup as a boy and wasn't afraid to push boundaries. His music is ever changing from 
disco to rock to it got harder with Nine Inch Nails for a little bit. And then he kind of went back to a more pop. He reinvents himself. And so I just thought Bowie was he's so he's just so cool he's a living legend and then tim curry very similar uh, colored outside of the lines i like people that aren't afraid to do things that are shock or different and he's done from fern golly to home alone to it to just everything tim curry i he's my favorite actor because he can switch it up and then uh weird al like i said i've always i crush my my crush i i want to marry weird al mm-hmm. now what is something people seem to misunderstand about you that's a good question. I think a lot of people think I'm mean or brash or self-centered um, or unapproachable. I've gotten that. Like, I was afraid to meet you. Like, I thought you were going to be mean or what. And I'm really, I, I love everybody. I want to talk to everybody. I'm nice. I'm welcoming. Um, I'm open-minded. Uh, I People are afraid of me. And I don't get that. I think I'm uh, sweet and nice. and I But they're like intimidated by me. I've gotten that a lot. Mm -hmm. So no, I know your mom. So please define motherhood in your own words. It's messy. It's messy. It's hard. It's rough. It is for sure the cliche hardest, most rewarding thing. I love it. It's my favorite job I've ever had in the world. And I've grown so much. Like I didn't cook before having a kid. Legit. I didn't cook. I just would get takeout or go to a gas station and pick up a sandwich. So my sons have taught me how to cook and how to clean and how to be an awesome person and so much responsibility and slowed me down. So I I love being a mom. It's the coolest thing, but I, I have two cool kids too. They made it easy. So what's been the most rewarding thing as a mom for you? They say, I love you and hug me and need me feeling needed and learning from them like what, you know, how to love them and how they need to be loved. And it's just, it's so rewarding. I think there's a lot of things I've gotten wrong in life, but something I've gotten really right is being a mom. I just, it's a natural thing for me. I'm a very motherly nurturing person. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what things do you want to teach your kids as they get, get older? To be open and honest about mental health. That's really important in our family um, to come to me when they're not doing good, when they're not feeling good. Um, Also, if they fucked up to tell me because I'm not going to judge them. I am just going to be for the be there for them 24 seven. And to know how unperfect we are. I think I grew up in a little bit of a family that's like, oh, we're the perfect family. Like everyone really thought we were the perfect family, you know, and like they're so cute and like they would portray this um, idea and then they'd come home and fight and hate each other and like sleep in separate bedrooms. And I really dislike that. So I want my kids to know reality and be real and raw and not be a fake version of themselves or afraid to be like, hey, I'm different and I like this. I'm like, cool. Then just tell everybody you like that. Mm -hmm. So now how do you approach discussing with your children about things to hear from their friends? Um, they pretty much come to me about when they hear things or, you know, already bully behavior, or obviously the vaccine caused a lot of discussions at school of some people are getting it, you know, I'm not what's going on. And it's just like, you know, I want them to be free thinkers. I want them to be able to challenge me. I think that's really important. I kind of felt like if I went to my parents, that was the end sentence period of what the discussion was. And I want them to know like, hey, I'm human. I make mistakes. Let me research that, what you're talking about. I don't know everything about that. And then this is how I feel, but you don't have to feel like that. How do you feel? Letting them know that they can disagree with my opinions or how I think and feel is really important. Mm -hmm. So now how do you balance your work life and being a mom? That is hard because I will say I'm tired. I'm tired a lot. And then we joked about being a morning person. Like I can hit a 6 p.m. wall. Because like I said, I get the kids up at 6 a.m. and Monday through Friday and I make them breakfast, get them to school. I help out in kindergarten for about 30 minutes, though. So I'm not home till about 9, 8.45, 9. And then I will finally eat. And then I'll start the podcast or I'll have a house flip project or I'll look at the stock market, something like that. And then I'll clean the house and go get them at 2 o'clock and 2.50, do homework, sports, 
bedtime. And then I drop them off with their dads on Friday and I go to work usually Friday night and Saturday and Sunday, sometimes just Saturday and Sunday. So then I bartend on the weekend and sleep is very rare and it's, uh, it's barely squeezed in there because I do, I like to hustle and make money and I like to parent. So I don't, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, I'm not worried. Now, what does happiness mean to you? That's good. Happiness. I think being true and authentic and getting your needs met and not being afraid to ask for your needs to be met. One thing I'm getting better at and I'm learning more is relationships, like sexual relationships. I'm really good at friendships. I'm really good at being a mom. Like those are two areas that come naturally. And I have a lot of friends. I have not been as good as in sexual relationships, asking for my needs to be met or seeing the red flags and not ignoring them, but being like, oh, okay, that's probably not a good fit or a good person, or I'm giving more, or this person isn't meeting my needs or expectations. It's time to leave. So I'm trying to get better at that. Mm -hmm. Now questions to end the episode. What is giving you hope right now? Oh, my kids. Definitely. Like they're so excited about everything. Like my younger son found rocks and he was so excited that they were magical rocks and he gave them to me. And so just seeing the joy and light in their eyes that everything's so exciting and their imagination is still flourishing. Cause you know, as adults, we lose the light sometimes in our eyes. So watching my kids and the grow up and become fine young gentlemen, it gives me hope. Mm. Now, what are three podcasts you recommend to my listeners and why? Definitely call her daddy. I love call her daddy. I mean, Alex is phenomenal at what she does. She's very relatable. I love that she's um, cozy in sweats pants. Like I just think everyone instantly feels like their family when they walk in. She transitions very good. Then I like baby mamas, no drama. I'm a mom myself. I co-parent. It's about getting along and there are two baby mamas with one was married to the guy and one's with him now and they can actually get along great and have fun, you know, mom advice. And then of course, Joe Rogan, like he is, he's the God to me. I would Wayne's world. I'm not worthy to Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, all them. Like I I love their views on the world and the information that they give me. And they'll just have the coolest, like this guy studies ancient Greek mythology and he's coming on, but then they're like, do you want to get stoned before we do this? And it's just kind of neat. It's like relatable and educational. Mm -hmm. So now if you had the attention of the world for five minutes, what would you want to tell them? This could be however you want to answer the question. Ooh, you have some great questions. For sure, like my last podcast statement about religion is how much we all want to be loved and accepted and how much we want to be heard and we want to be hugged and I think it's important that even if you have kids or you don't to understand that we all were children once and we all had a bright light and an idea and a dream and some of us still have that in us and some of us have been hurt so bad that it's like the shelter dog you know you need to go slow when you go up to to pet them but we're we're more alike than we would think and to lead with kindness and acceptance more than oh this is diverse we're too different i probably wouldn't like this person or I'm going to be mean or degrading because I don't like what they're saying. Move on with your life. If you see something you don't like and don't speak negatively, just do the positive comments. Mm. That's it. And lastly, where can people find you online? So definitely Steph's Rock Show and it's Steph with an F, S-T-E-F-S-R-O-C-K-S-H-O-W at Instagram and Steph's Rock Show on YouTube and Steph's World on Spotify. And you guys can find me on YouTube at Hockett Podcast, Instagram and, and TikTok is the same handle. Everything else related to me, you can find on my link tree, which is always in the show notes. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me on.